Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live, Ask the Doctor. I'm Carolyn Donaldson. Well, as the seasons are changing and that temperature keeps dropping, we become more susceptible to seasonal bugs and other illnesses. Tonight, doctors from local health care providers explain how to stay healthy heading into winter and what symptoms look like for the more common viruses at this time of year. They'll also take your questions. Now, let's meet our guests. Dr. Philip Miller is a family medicine provider with Mount Nittany Physician Group. Dr. Miller is board certified by the American Osteopathic Board of Neuromusculoskeletal Medicine and the American Osteopathic Board of Family Physicians. Dr. Timothy Doberstein is an internist working for Geisinger at its Scenery Park office in State College, providing primary care to patients 18 and over. He's worked for Geisinger since 2010 and is board certified in internal medicine. He also serves as chair for the Geisinger Center County Performance Improvement Committee and vice president of the Center County Medical Society. Thank you all both for being with us tonight. Thanks for having us. And again, you can join the conversation. Here you go. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242, and our email address is connect at WPSU.org. You may also tweet your question or comment using the hashtag WPSU Conversations, and all that information, of course, is there at the bottom of your screen. So let's get started. Again, gentlemen, thanks so much coming out on this cold night to talk yes. about what else but colds and flu. So let's start there. Um, it comes every year without fail, especially in this part of our country. Yes. Um, we develop, is it the cold, is it the flu? What are the differences between those things and, and how do we treat them? Sure. Well, I think prevention's always been the best medicine, I think. Um, you know, usually this time of year, it gets really cold out. People turn the heat up in the house. The air gets really dry. Things tend to dry up in the sinuses and get a little stagnant. So these people are more prone to developing infections, whether it's a viral infection, the flu, sinusitis, and, you know, a whole multitude of things. Uh, the tricky part comes to what exactly is affecting the patient. Okay, is it the virus? Is it the flu? Is it a bacterial sinus infection? Is it bronchitis? It could be a multitude of things. So, um, really, the best way to avoid all that is just to prevent it the best we can. Um, Dr. Doberstein was saying before how we washing hands, good hygiene, mm -hmm. right. drinking plenty of fluids throughout the day, yeah. staying and, healthy, and of course, you know, as Dr. Mo said, and prevention is is key. And you know, the big thing to do <clears throat> this time of year is get your flu shot. You know, go and mm -hmm. Get vaccinated against the flu. It's it's safe and and it has been very good in preventing the flu and and saving a lot of disease and cough and, and frustration. On, There's on no downside sense. to the flu vaccine that you see with your. No, patients it's not going to give you the flu. You know, okay. that's, that's a misnomer. It will not cause the flu, and it might cause a little muscle aches and pains for for a day or two. But mm -hmm. I think the benefit of the shot outweighs that risk of mm -hmm. those things. So I strongly recommend it to all of my patients that I see to okay. get that flu shot every year. And that's the adult side. How about the children's side? What kind of things do we have well, available? Same approach, really. Uh, I encourage all my parents to have their children immunized every year with the flu vaccine, make sure their immunization status is up to date with everything. Again, teaching them very good hand, um, hygiene, hand washing, not sharing utensils, for example. Mm -hmm. Again, you see that a lot. Um, you know, so not much different from that of an adult. Right. Common misconception is, Give me antibiotics, doc. I'm I'm feeling sick. Help me out here. What what advice and how do you tell the difference there? Sure. I, th I think if if you're concerned, uh, uh, you know, do I have the flu or, or or do is it a cold? You know, you can talk to your doctor, make a visit, get in to be seen. You know, um, it is true though that antibiotics will not help the common cold. Antibiotics uh, will not help that. It will not shorten the course. It will just breed resistance later on and actually cause more side effects than doing good. You know, mm -hmm. so. We, we want to evaluate that and, and make sure that we're not just giving antibiotics for the common cold. And like you said, if you're like, I'm not sure what it is, it might be something more. It might be might be the the, the flu. Get in, be seen, you know, to be to be evaluated, you know. And, and Dr. Miller had mentioned before about you know there are certain things that we can do to treat the flu if you get caught and come in in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this time of year, people get a multitude of things, and one thing can lead to another. Science congestion can lead to the common cold. The common cold can eventually lead to the flu. The flu can eventually lead to other illnesses. Okay, the trick, of course, is determining what's going on with the patient right at that moment. Best way to determine that is just to be seen by your primary care provider, your physician, to have them do a thorough physical exam, get a good history off of you, and mm -hmm. try and figure things out. Um, I usually tell patients that uh, you know if you have the flu, if you have a viral infection, you know, antibiotics are not going to really do anything. I can throw the best antibiotics in the world at you. It's not going to do much of anything. 
Okay. So. We have our first email, and okay, it's great. kind of on this similar topic, sure. but specifically, can you highlight any symptoms that you would suggest when you do need to see the doctor, you know, at, at that differentiating point, you know? Um, sure. I'd say I would come in if, if you've had symptoms that are just getting worse. You're not getting any better over a mm -hmm. couple of days. Things to be taking a downturn and, and not feeling good. You start having high fevers. Mm -hmm. You're not feeling well. You, you're having other symptoms where you say, I'm coughing, but I'm getting short of breath, or I I'm having trouble breathing. I can't sleep. You know, my sore throat is, is isolated and I have no other symptoms but a high fever. I think those are key signs that you should probably make a visit to come on in and be evaluated. Mm -hmm. And really, anytime you're concerned, okay, and um, you can see your doctor at any time or call him up at any time and just have him reassure you, okay, if you are concerned about anything, because you never know. You can never be too careful. Okay. You know, so. And on the prevention side, as we keep on this topic for just a little bit longer um, with the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, you got, you're, you're, you're exposed to a lot of germs when you have children, when you're around children, mm -hmm. when you're taking your kids to school, et cetera, et cetera. So what more uh, efficiencies can be exercised within that family domain, I guess, with, with prevention? <laughs> Very good question because all three of my kids were sick last week. So, <laughs> so you <laughs> so, actually experienced so, that. Yourself, yeah, right? I, I, I feel everybody's pain out there they, if they have kids. Um, you know, again, teach them good, ha um, good hygiene. Uh, I hate to say segregate them from each other, but it's a lot easier said than done. Um, I mean, we have a seven month old at home and you know, I adore him immensely and my two girls adore him immensely as well. But if they're sick, he's gonna get sick too because it's a really hard time trying to keep them away from each other. So uh, really teaching your kids, hand washing, um, being gentle with, um, with the little ones and you know, so really it's a, the same advice, but um, it, it's really hard to isolate one person being sick out of the entire household. Eventually I think everybody will get sick, mm -hmm. uh, case in point. Again, my three children, and now this week, yours truly <laughs> is bit. just getting over something. So oh boy, it happens. And in the adult population, there are some risk um, populations, right? You really have to be careful depending on age and, and absolutely. It, you, you want to be careful yeah. as you know, getting over 65 and, and such. The immune system might start to wean immunity and be more susceptible things. Also, too, there's there's certain people out there that might have immunosuppressing diseases such as chronic kidney disease or diabetes. So if you fall into those categories or you have an immunosuppressive where your immune system doesn't work as well, mm -hmm. or somebody that's going under chemotherapy for cancer, for example, where the immune system is suppressed, I would be very eager and apt to call your doctor sooner than later because those people, mm -hmm. those populations are much more prone to getting sicker quickly and should be seen pretty quickly. Okay. And again, we offer um, you to give us a call and let us know what your questions are concerning this issue or anything related to um, the medicine practice, especially right here in central Pennsylvania. We do have another uh, um, email that came in here. Let's take a look. Albert writes, I'm starting to come down with a cold. I don't want to fall behind on my running routine. Okay, so here's an active person, 25-year-old, ah. whose symptoms start a few days ago, haven't gotten too bad, runs outside, and allergies aren't a concern, but... It'll be 40 degrees and dark when he gets home and can run. So is it a good idea to run or just rest at this point if those symptoms keep coming on? So if it were me, I'd probably say take a day or two off. You know, take a day or two off, rest, force those fluids, get some water in you, hydration, you know, get plenty of rest at night, get, get enough sleep, and then, you know, go out back at it and hit it, you know, in a couple of days. Yeah. And listen to your body. Hmm. Your body knows best. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Well, let's move on as we're waiting for more calls and talk about another very big news item that came out just this week, as a matter of fact, and that's the American Heart Association, uh, the Joint American College of Cardiology, both changing those numbers on high blood pressure. Uh, it's a little frightening to think all oh, more than half of the American population now is really at risk. For these new numbers? Yeah, that, that's correct. That that just came out this week. Where Give us an idea. I, I didn't even <laughs> brief myself on the numbers. Absolutely. You know. you know, so we used to consider high blood pressure really anything over the number 140 over 90, and, and that's where we would kind of say that's where we need to treat it. Sure. They came out this week and, and basically said the goal is less than 120 over 80, which is a significant change. The, the verbiage also eliminated this prehypertension. There is no more prehypertension. It's either normal elevated, or now we consider hypertension to start at the number of, of 130 over 80. Well, that's a narrower that's window. That's a narrow window, you got that right. Wow. And 
the, the also too the emphasis is is that it's not just when you see that number treating with the medication but it's also lifestyle changes making sure if you can you get that exercise in 30 to 40 minutes a couple days a week eating a healthier diet you know reducing salt getting plenty of fresh fruits fresh vegetables into that diet even reducing stress, meditation, things of that, kind of hitting it from all sides, not just treating with the medication. Also too, it's important to remember when you're at the doctor's office, sometimes the, the blood pressure is a little bit elevated and we need to realize that and we need to yes. realize that that is an, an actual number, but possibly taking readings at home with a cuff and, and mm -hmm. things of that so we can kind of get a big picture of how high that blood pressure really is. Good point. Mm -hmm. We do have a call. Let's Great. hear from Dick from Johnstown. Dick, you're on the air. Your question, sir? Thank, thank you. Uh, I'm elderly, and um, two weeks ago, I, I got the high-dosage uh, flu serum. And I was wondering how it qualifies to be called high-dosage. Is there more serum in the injection, or, or is it a different uh, mixture? And, and I have another question, too. Uh, one doctor, I believe, mentioned that a common cold could lead to the flu. I was unaware of that, and perhaps you could just synopsize that real quickly. Thank you, gentlemen. Goodbye. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much for the call, and, and I think I'll take the, the first part of that and sure. do that. And the, the high dose <clears throat> flu shot actually has a little bit more in it to increase your immune response. Sometimes it's thought that patients 65 or older or who have immunosuppressing conditions will not respond as well to the regular flu shot. So this high dose flu shot has a little bit more kick, so to speak. So it gets the immune system up and has actually a little bit more um, availability to help fight the flu in the body for those populations that need it. Um, with that though, there is a little bit more risk, about 50% more risk of side effects from the flu, achiness, muscle pains, things of that. So you always, when you're going into that, have to weigh the, the risks, the benefits, and, and with that. But there's really more in, in, in there to uh, cause an immune response so we get a better uh, reaction from the shot. And likely a doctor would have recommended that high dosage for that patient. Mm -hmm. Correct. For okay. example, okay. All right, and Dick, you offer a very good question there, uh, and I probably, should have clarified a little bit better for you. Um, as I was saying, this time of year, people tend to get the sniffles, runny nose, congested sinuses, whatever. Um, it just happens with a seasonal change, okay? We're exposed to more bugs and more infections, more viruses that are out there, and our body amounts this immune response in order to combat that, okay? And usually is in the form of increased mucus production, increased blood pressure, maybe a little bit. Um, and uh, I usually find that you know people who are at home, they have the heat on, it dries the air out, that causes everything in your sinuses to get really thick and tenacious. So it traps, you know, the mucus is there to trap bugs and debris and viruses and everything, but um, if it doesn't go anywhere, if it stays within your sinuses, you're basically causing a breeding ground, which is why I really try to emphasize drinking plenty of fluids, getting plenty of rest, try to keep everything as moving the best that you can. Um, it can potentially lead to developing a cold or the flu later on. Um, so, as I was saying, you know, prevention being the best medicine here. So, you can take over the counter, you know, cough medicine, any medications to help with any kind of body aches or pains, drinking plenty of fluids, getting plenty of rest, eating right. If you smoke, please don't smoke because I can also contribute to, you know, developing diseases later on, you know, based on that. Okay, and as I was mentioning before, if you are concerned, by all means, come in, see your family physician, see your internist, see your, um, see your doctor, get checked out. They might be able to treat you with medications or any other treatment at their disposal to prevent anything else from occurring further on down the line. Now, I'm not saying that um, when people have um, any kind of congestion or any kind of colds, it's going to uh, automatically... You know, yeah. you know, go into a, okay. to another illness. But, you know, at that time, you know, your immune system is, you know, getting a little bit of workout. It's getting a little bit taxed in there. So it might get a little tired and leave you more prone for infections later on. So all more important to try and stay healthy, get plenty of rest, eat right, okay, and, of course, see your friendly neighborhood doctor. Okay. We have a tweet. Jen tweets, okay. what is the best way to prevent spreading sickness in the workplace? Now that is mm -hmm. another Petri dish I think we all have to live in, right? At some point yeah. or another. I, I think, you know, that's a great question. And, you know, my big advice, if you are sick and you are able, stay home. Stay home and rest. Stay home and, and, and 
you know, be in, in bed and, and get that f uh, rest that you need to help fight the, the virus or, or whatever you are. If you are unable to, to stay home, you know, and, and have to go into work, I think it's, again, hand washing. I think it's if you need to sneeze, sneeze into your arm and not just out in, in there mm. and trying to keep to yourself, so to speak, and, and, and not spread the virus because viruses love the spread and they and they do very well at doing that so even just by shaking hands or, or, or touching something that's contaminated you can pick that up so I think like we say prevention is the key and, and my advice would be if you are sick try to stay home mm -hmm. and, and get your flu shot fact, yeah and get your flu shot on the kid Absolutely. factor a lot of schools have taken a more progressive or right. you know proactive approach to saying mm -hmm. hey it's better for everybody if the child stays out of exactly. that environment too, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So, working, Absolutely. Work. Yeah. When, when, when the nurse says, you know, come get your child, please do, mm -hmm. right? Yes. If, you, if, if you're able to. Yeah, so. yeah. especially if they're fever, I'll keep them home. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. All right. We have uh, Carolyn from Kerwinsville who is on the phone right now. Carolyn, you're on the air? Yes, I have a question for the doctors. Do they recommend any supplements like vitamin C or zinc when you have a cold? Thank you, Carolyn. We'll have yep. those doctors address Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, anything that's going to help stimulate your immune system, vitamin C and zinc, I think, are absolutely important. I take it myself every day. Every day. So and I just want to be careful that because there are some supplements are better than others that are out there. All right. So you want to be mindful of that. Uh, I will say that um, uh, one of the most common vitamins that are out there is uh, from a company called Nature's Made. And I like this brand, one, because they're pretty much everywhere. This is not a, a shameless plug, by the way. I apologize. So, mm -hmm. um, But um, you can find it anywhere, any pharmacy, any supermarket. And this is the first um, vitamin company that voluntarily donated all their products to a third-party lab to have them tested. And they've been tested for purity, for efficacy, and for everything. And they've passed with flying colors. So mm -hmm. um, essentially, there is um, you know, these vitamins, they have what's called the uh, the USP logo on it. So if you look for USP on a vitamin bottle, you know it's a quality product. Yeah, I I, I don't think it's going to hurt, you know, to, to take those and may supplement that. I don't think it's a harmful thing. I think the big thing that I try to force in, in addition to supplements, and we've kind of harped on this a little bit, is, is just getting that rest and, and staying for the fluids and, and making sure that you're staying hydrated. Right. Now, is it necessary? No. Okay. It's, it, it's certainly helpful, but certainly not necessary. So um, you don't have to go and spend a fortune on, on sure. vitamins and minerals you don't need. But, mm -hmm. but it is helpful. Okay. Anything else, general information that we want to make sure that our viewers and listeners uh, uh, are armed with for this winter season? Well, is there anything new out there? I think that's... they're asking some brilliant <laughs> questions. So, and uh, you know, thanks to them, they remind us what we should cover. And I think Absolutely. we've pretty much covered most of everything here. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate the calls and, and the tweets and the emails and, and covered a lot of things, you know, and it's, it's basically making sure, you know, you get your flu shot, you stay home if you can, you know, you, you, you reduce the risk of spread. And, and I think that will help a lot going on in this, this winter season. Let's hear from Huntingdon now. Curtis from Huntingdon's calling in. Curtis? Yes. Yes, you're on the air, sir. Um, I was wondering, I got a flu shot Tuesday, and I was wondering how these, how long these flu-type symptoms are going to last. Well, that's a good question, Curtis, and, and thank you for that. And, and usually what we say is it's going to be about three to four days uh, that you might get a little bit of those aches and such. And if you are able, maybe maybe take some Tylenol if, if you can um, to kind of reduce that and, and get that rest. But it, it should be out of the system pretty quickly. If you feel that it's not going away, you know, in the next couple of days, it'd probably be a good idea to get in to see your, your family physician or, or, or get evaluated. All right. Thank you, Curtis. Let's talk a little bit about uh, immunizations and other vaccines. And first, let's talk about the kids, because you okay. mentioned, in fact, that we've had some changes here in Pennsylvania in the mm -hmm. schools. And, and, you know, uh, I think that fall kind of opened up some uh, opportunities for more vaccinations and more kids to be evaluated, right? Mm, absolutely. So um, everything's kind of normed out now. Everybody's vaccinated that should be that, you know, you can't enter school without the proper proper yeah, things. Of course. So that seems to be doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Are there any newer things on the horizon that are coming up in the children's sector? Nothing I know right now, okay. uh, but you know, things are always changing. Uh, immunization schedules are constantly being updated okay, to figure out what's best. Um, so my big suggestion is just, you know, contact your physician, um, talk to him about his opinion about the vaccinations. Keep on top of so that. For keep the on kids. top of them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I just, you know, I, 
couldn't hurt to continuously to immunize your children and make sure they're safe. And what about adults? Because we do understand there's some some new things on the horizon. Yeah, now. just just recently, uh, <clears throat> the CDC uh, voted to uh, move forward and approve a, a new shot to combat shingles, uh, which can be exquisitely painful and, and, and cause a lot of problems. And um, this shot will now be indicated for adults 50 and over, and uh, has just been approved and is in production right now. And different than the current shingles vaccine, it will actually be a two-step where you get the first one on day zero and then the second one on month two to six. Um, and again, currently the shingles vaccine from, if you look at the ACIP, they recommend it for 60 and over. The new one will be indicated for anybody 50 and over. Okay. So that's new. Also too, one thing I wanna throw out there that recently the uh, vaccine schedules did change and there is a recommendation now for adults 65 and over to get two different types of pneumonia shots. Um, it used to be just one and it's two. And again, if you feel like, ah, maybe I should get them, talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. Keep in touch and keep, keep that relationship Keep going. asking, yep. can't hurt to ask. All right, we've got another um, email, it looks like, from Jerome. He writes, several years ago, it uh, was stated that no one, uh, that, that one does not catch a cold from being cold or chilled, but that a cold was caused by microorganisms, germs, or whatever. But, however, it's been my experience that being cold, chilled, or damp makes me sick on a regular basis. How can that be explained? Does becoming chilled make the germs more likely to cause illness? I've been there, I've felt mm -hmm. that, and yeah. I've wondered myself. Doctors? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Anything that stresses the body stresses the immune system. So your immune system now has to fight harder if you're exposed to germs. So if you're in a warm, sunny climate and you're exposed to the same germs, your body's gonna be able to fight that off fairly easy. But if it's stressed because it's cold, it's chilled, it's tired, it's stressed, uh, I think I can speak for anybody, um, any graduate student here at Penn State who is studying for their final exams, they're under stress and they feel miserable right afterwards because their immune system just plummeted because of all the stress that they were under. Mm. So the cold itself does not, or the, the cold weather itself does not cause the illness, but it makes you more susceptible to the illness. And for the adult population? Same thing, you know, same thing. There's no real change there. We, we tend to see a lot more disease this time of year because it is cold and things are more closed. The windows are closed. People are inside more, touching the same thing. So germs just love to spread in those environments. But if the body is stressed from extreme temperatures, whether it's being very cold or, or being very hot, uh, we're gonna see uh, a more susceptibility to infection. Great, active audience here. Let's get right to Joe mm -hmm. from Falls Creek. He's calling in now. Joe, you're on the air. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think you sort of sported, uh, started my question about workplaces, but... Uh, He's calling in now, Joe, you're on the air? Yes. Go, go ahead, Joe. Okay, I uh, was wondering how long these pathogens or germs or viruses live on surfaces like the backs of chairs and doorknobs and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I had a supervisor that uh, was right on top of that all the time, wiping that kind of stuff off. That's Thank you, Joe. We'll, yeah. we'll answer that. I, I, yeah, it's a great question, Joe. And, and I think it depends on the, on the bug itself. Different classes of, of viruses tend to live longer or shorter based on how long they're, they're out of the body. Some it's within a day. Some can, if, it's, if the environment is moist and, and it's there, can live for a couple more days. Sure. And I think, you know, like you said, your, your, your supervisor and you were on top of it. And, and the big thing is, is keeping it clean, you know, wiping things down, making sure that you use, you know, solutions that will kill the bugs and, and, and get rid of them so they don't grow at all. This is not being a clean machine. It's good when you go in the grocery store to wipe that bar off. And, Absolutely. Sure. You know, all sure. of those things are there for, for your purposes. Mm -hmm. What about the hand sanitizer controversy? Is it, is it good? Is it bad? Are there better ones than others? You know, you've heard of people saying, oh, that's, you know, that's yeah. just a sales I mean, mechanism to get those things sold in multitudes. You know, again, it's the uh, susceptibility of the bug. What kind of bug is it? Mm. You know, so there are certain bugs that I want to say respond well, but I will say that uh, are easily clean using the hand sanitizer. Others prefer, right. not prefer, but <laughs> others are more effectively cleaned with washing your hands with soap and water. So, so no downside so, to doing no, this. No, no downside to it. No downside. I, I, I kind of preach wash your hands. You know, the, the, you have the hand sanitizer if, if you need it in, in a crutch and you, you don't have availability to water or you're out in, in, the, in the middle of somewhere where you don't have access to soap sure. and things like that. But if, if you have access to soap and water, use that soap and water because, mm -hmm. you know, like Dr. Miller just said, there are bugs out there that are very hardy and that hand sanitizer is just not going to do it and it's going to spread. Mm -hmm. That seems simple, but... Effective, both yeah. doctors agree on that, mm -hmm. all right. 
Bear with me here. If you're just joining us, my name's Carolyn Donaldson, and this is Conversations Live. Ask the Doctor here on WPSU. Our guests tonight are Dr. Philip Miller, a family medicine provider with the Mount Nittany Physician Group, and Dr. Timothy Doberstein, an internist with Geisinger Scenery Park Office in State College. And again, our telephone number, we're getting some calls, so please uh, bear with us and keep calling 1-800-543-8242. Our panel's ready to take your phone calls. If you prefer to email us, our address is connect at WPSU.org. And we do have an email that came in, so let's start on that. Terry writes, my stomach was aching last week. I assumed it was just from eating some old leftovers. I've been there. Mm -hmm. But a friend thinks I might be developing an intolerance to some kind of food. How would I know if this was the case? So we're moving into the digestive yeah. tract uh -huh. now. Well, I think it, again, if, if, if you have it on a question, I think it's contacting your, your family physician or, and saying, hey, I, I have these concerns and kind of going from there, there's, there's different testing out there and you know, the doctor will kind of ask some questions and, and maybe do exam to say, are you developing gastric reflux? Are you having allergies? Was it a, a, a bug from the food that you ate? You know, and it can kind of lead us down to, to different testing and do we need to refer to an allergist if you're concerned about susceptibilities and going from there. But I think it starts by getting in to see your, your family physician and, and seeing what we got. What about kids? Because they can't always tell you what's going on, but they know, you know, mom knows they're not quite themselves in some right. of those scenarios. Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's, I think a lot of it's trial and error, especially with young kids that can't really communicate what it is that they're feeling. I mean, some of them will complain of a tummy ache, others may seem bloated, or there may be a, really the, uh, the biggest thing that you'll see is probably a change in their personality. They may seem, you know, very irritable or very hyper, um, or, or even very lethargic, okay? I mean, if you see a personality change after they've eaten something, then, you know, that's, you know, one cause of concern, you might wanna have that checked out. Now, of course, if they're, um, if they're doubled over, holding their tummy, you know, they probably have, I mean, you know, it still could be a food intolerance, but mm -hmm. I mean, in still situations like that, you still want them to be evaluated by the pediatrician or by their family physician. Okay, okay speaking of food, we've got to talk about that part of the prevention factor, uh -huh. eating oh, yeah. the good stuff, right? Yes. yes. What is the good stuff this day, uh, these days, and how do you <laughs> find that right mix for you? Yeah, and, and that's a great question, and I think that's a little different from, from everybody, but I have some general guidelines that I, I often recommend to patients and, and then say, you know, make sure you're getting in those fresh fruits, those fresh vegetables, you know, there's the strive for five or eat five servings every day. And, and I'm a big believer in that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and making sure you're, you're doing as minimal process to those, meaning not frying them or adding a lot of butter or additives to them, you know, to get them in because they do help, you know, they help with bowels and they help with, you know, reducing pressure and things. And the other big part of it too is watching the salt. I, I find that, you know, some people out there will say, well, you know, I may not put salt on anything, but you have to realize it's in a lot of foods right. already, you know. <laughs> I, I encourage people to, to go out if you do read the label, you know, read how much salt is already in there, you know, and you want to kind of limit it if you can, you know, to, to two, less than two grams, 1.5, you know, a, a day and, you know, see what we have and, <clears throat> you know, go from there. But always read the labels. Talk to your doctor about that and, and see what we got. Okay. Absolutely, I agree 100%. I think just regular whole foods, minimally processed. Uh, I've always told patients, you know, try and stay away from simple sugars, refined carbohydrates. Those, I think, are the, are the biggest culprits that really mess up with people's diets. Uh, whenever you go to the supermarket, try to stay to the outside area of the supermarket. Don't go in the aisles. The aisles are where all the processed food is, okay? And if you do get some of this food, yeah. You know, like I was saying, you know, read the labels, okay, and be very cognizant of it because there's a lot of things that sneak up in there. Um, when we talk about salt, I have my basic spiel every time with a patient. Anything like chips, pretzel, soda, bacon, sausage, we're in Pennsylvania, so scrapple. <laughs> uh, frozen foods, canned right. foods, okay, hot dogs, cold cuts, okay, a lot of these things have a added salt, salt in it, okay, right. and it will surprise you, okay, and you may surprise yourself if you eliminate these things from your diet. How better you how feel. How better you will right. feel. There you go. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you know, one thing I, I suggest a lot of times to, to people too, you know, to watch the carbohydrates, you know, the breads, mm -hmm. the pastas, mm -hmm. and, and, and one thing that y you can do sometimes is instead of, you know, putting in all the, the pasta is taking, uh, you know, squash or something like that and, you know, spiraling sure. it down, you know, mm -hmm. substituting it out. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I do that at home. My, my wife's a vegetarian and she initially said, maybe we should, you know, try doing this. And I initially thought, that's going to taste terrible, you know. I miss my pasta, but uh, we did it, and it tastes very good. You know, I was very surprised, and, and and I think it's a great way to to still have the taste, but but cut those complex carbohydrates sure. out. 
All yeah. right. And if you are gonna have carbohydrates, I would recommend that you eat it with something. Okay? okay. Not just carbohydrates alone. If you're gonna have a little bit of pasta, have some sort of protein along with it or have some to break sort of, it down. To break it down, exactly. Okay. It helps, you know, slow down the sugar spike in your system, it slows down the insulin spike, okay? That's something I recommend to my diabetic patients all the time. You know, try to mix up you know, the food the best you can with the right amount of proteins, the right amount of fats. So and that's just a whole other conversational piece. Right, <laughs> that gets a little technical. Right now, so. Again, referring yeah. to your family doctor and then who may refer you on to a dietitian for your sure. own specific Great. ingredients. Catherine from Altoona is calling in right now. Catherine, you're on the air. Hi, uh, I'm glad to hear from you again, Carol, and I, I, I miss hearing you on uh, another station, but uh, I'm glad to, to get to hear Thank from you, you again. Thank you. Uh, I, found, I came across this program, and I find it rather rather interesting. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, know about this virus that's going around the schools that I heard there's a virus called um, throat and foot virus or hand and foot virus or something. It has to do with mm -hmm. sore throats and, and, and skin, it gets, gets skin irritations on your hands and mm -hmm. See, because I have some relatives and some uh, family members who have this, and I guess the children got it, and then the parents also got really sick from it. And I guess I'm understanding that they still have it, and it's been going on for maybe the second week or so. So um, I was just curious to know, what is this virus actually called? I'm, and I don't know if I got the proper name, but okay. and I'm just wondering what causes it and how people can get rid of it. You know, and it's... It's something new. I've never heard of this one before. Thank you. Our doctors are nodding, so we'll let them answer. Thank you, Catherine. So it sounds like hand, foot, and mouth disease. Okay. okay. Oftentimes, you know, you get that from contaminated food or contaminated meat. It is a virus. Okay. Uh, we do see it in kids a lot. They tend to develop sores over their mouths and their hands and their feet. Um, you know, it typically is a self-limiting virus, so a lot of the treatment is symptomatic. Uh, there are medications to help kind of calm things down a little bit. Again, it's you know, something if you're really concerned about, you know, do see your family physician, okay? I mean, it, how is it spread? I'm sorry, I missed that part. Uh, usually, um, it can spread from person to person. It can, okay. It can okay. be contracted from eating um, contaminated meat, food products. So, again, you want to be careful. And are the symptoms so. the same in adults then, too? Mm -hmm. They can be. It's, it's, it's much more common in children uh, okay. from experiences, but it still happens in adults, and, and the symptoms are similar. You, mm -hmm. you see, you know, lesions in the mouth, oral ulcers can be very painful to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, you also have sores on the hands and the feet, and really it's symptomatic and, and pain control. It, it, it can happen to adults as well, but still really more common in children. Mm -hmm. You can't put your kid in a bubble, but you can reduce some of that, yes. like you said, by mm -hmm. those common, yeah. common things. Okay, and the old adage where um, I think it's the old-fashioned the old way of thinking, you know, is get your kids out there and playing with sick kids to boost their immune system. Right. Um, I'm not an advocate of that. Okay. Because, uh, I mean, kids are going to get sick eventually. They are going to come in contact you with You don't need eventually. to expose yeah. them to extra You don't need stuff. to expose them. Okay. okay. I remember we had to play with a kid with the chicken pox, you know, when I was yes. a kid because he was lonely. Oh. Okay. No. <laughs> not the way of... <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it worked. I got the chicken pox, but, yeah, <laughs> but I may absolutely. have to get the new shingles vaccine eventually at yeah. some point, yeah. right? So, there you go. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but they, you know, they will get exposed at some point, okay? okay. Um, better to have them just exposed a little bit here and there as opposed to actually being in contact with somebody who truly is sick. All right. St. Mary's is calling. We've got Don on the line from St. Mary's. Don? Yes. You're go ahead. Go ahead, Don. Yes. Uh, I wanted to pass on to a a thing that happened to me, I had a new rug put in, and I didn't know it at the time, but it was treated with Scotchgard. And I didn't know it until after the rug was in, and I was highly allergic to this. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen to many people, but any time of the year you have a new rug put in, it would be very uh, contaminated or overdone with this Scotchgard. So uh, I had to have the whole scotch guard rug taken out and I, fortunately i had hardwood floors underneath it oh, that's and good. uh my uh, uh doctor he was very uh, interested because he never heard of it and then mm. the people said oh it's only where the rug was manufactured so they only had six people but they did reimburse me for the rug oh that's good well yeah and not <laughs> many people important. know this not right. many people know this and all rugs are treated with scotch guard today all of mm -hmm. them well, 
Well, thank you, Don. Thanks. Thank you yeah, for the nice information. Yeah. And doctor, how does that work with allergies? You know, when, when people come in with these kind of obscure things, the connections, how, sure. how is that made? No, absolutely. <laughs> it, it's made, in, you know, again, by, by talking to, to the patient and seeing it's, is there a, a repetitive allergic trigger that you're seeing or a time of year or a mm -hmm. place in the house or, or something of that and, you know, kind of going down that line of questioning and, you know, are there over-the-counter medicines such as Claritin or, 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 Benadryl or something like sure. that that, that can help or you know if they're more severe you might and you might have a question mm, I don't know if this patient's allergic or not mm -hmm. you can refer for allergy testing you can be allergy tested to to multiple things out there and you know, to multiple foods if that's a question as well so um, that's something too that you know you talk to your doctor and it can be handled okay yeah. we have a, a question here an email Viv writes what do you think of echinacea for helping uh, or for helping uh, or cold prevention, I guess. So another supplement or herbal type of remedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there's not a lot of studies that say, yeah, yeah echinacea is, is really been shown to be proven to be beneficial. I, I don't think echinacea is going to hurt. You know, I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to harm or, or uh, immune uh, suppress somebody. So if you feel like it works for you, I think it's okay. You just have to keep in mind, there's no evidence that says, yep, you know, echinacea has been shown to reduce symptoms or something like that, to my knowledge. Um, so I think it's, it's just to be if it works for you, okay. I don't think it's going to harm you. But again, as I say to, to all my patients and, you know, Dr. Miller had brought up before, just be very careful with supplements, you know, where they're manufactured, how are they manufactured, what is the dose that you're getting in uh, to be sure that you're actually getting what you paid for and what you want. And what were those signs on the label itself you can look USP. for? USP. USP, yep. You definitely want that on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else in the line of vitamins or any other type of new age kind of medicines, I guess we'll call them, and that's okay. perhaps the mis misnomer there. Um, right. You're hearing perhaps some trends and some things that are fads, I guess, yeah. right well, now. I mean, well, I mean, well, one thing I, I do practice is what's called osteopathic manipulation. Sure. Uh, I am a DO on board certified through the American Academy of um, Osteopathic Neuromusculoskeletal Medicine Osteopathic Manipulation. Um, what is it exactly? It's, uh, it's very similar to what a chiropractor or what a massage therapist might do. Uh, it's really the whole belief that the body has its own ability and, and innate uh, action to heal and maintain itself, mm -hmm. but we just give it the proper conditions. All right, mm -hmm. so uh, especially this time of year, you know, I do see a lot of people coming in with you know, the same symptoms, sinus congestion, cough, their head feels 20 pounds heavier than what it should be, they're having shortness of breath or coughing up a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I'm able to do adjustments that mm -hmm. help improve circulation to the sinuses, help drain the sinuses out, help improve respirations, takes away you know, quite a bit of their aches and pains. And you know, what I like about this treatment is that it's, it's fairly quick, I mean, it happens practically immediately mm -hmm. after I'm done working on the patient as soon as they stand up and then they feel just everything begin to drain from their sinuses. What, so, what that, I'm go ahead. Oh, no, I'm saying what I'm hearing from both of you is a holistic approach and, right. and the less, mm -hmm. you know, it's more prevention and clean living and right. healthy yeah. living well, that really well, helps. Well, essentially, I mean, instead of trying to interfere with the disease process, we want to help the body heal itself. And that's mm -hmm. essentially what it does, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we've, I've never cured anybody of anything. I just give the body, their body, a helping hand. So if I were to give you an antibiotic, which I still do, I mean, on top of the manipulations I do, I still prescribe antibiotics and do mm -hmm. other prescription medications. Um, so what am I doing? Am I, did I cure you the disease? Well, no, what I did was I gave your immune system a chance to help fight off the infection itself. Mm -hmm. Even then, even if I give you that medication, your body still has to get the medication circulated to the diseased tissue and your body still has to get rid of all the metabolites and cellular debris and all the toxins that have built up. Okay, the body does that itself. Okay, wow. I just help it along. Help it along. Okay, I think it's what most physicians do to begin with is they help the body. Hmm. You know, I agree 100%. Uh, I, I think that I really, with going back to the blood pressure issue, I, I, I don't like adding medicines. I, I, I like to not see patients on medicine for their high blood pressure. Now, mm -hmm. granted, if you need a medicine, you need a medicine. But I, I love to see eating healthier, reducing that blood pressure, mm -hmm. or, you know, getting out and finding an exercise program that works for you. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's not, it's just like running works and that's it. No, there's multiple things out there and finding something that fits into your lifestyle and fits in, you know, to what you like to do and, and, and that you can stick with it, you know, sure. that will help, you know, and, and I'd rather see my patients and anybody do that and, 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 you know, maybe lose a little bit of weight if they need to lose a little bit of weight um, to do that to combat disease rather than adding more pills to the mix. Good point. Yeah. I think every physician can tell you that once they've seen 
the weight loss, a lot of dramatic results occur. I mean, they're less diabetic medication, blood pressure right. comes down, they feel so much better. You yeah. know, people with arthritic knees, okay, all that goes weight away. Not, goes away. It, it's yeah. it's really does is amazing. Um, it's a hard yeah, it, sell sometimes. It, 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 it's, 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 your hard, it's a hard sell. Um, but you know, when you think about it, I mean, how long did it take you to get to where you were? How long did it take you to become 300 pounds? Mm -hmm. It didn't happen overnight. It took a lifetime of, mm -hmm. of choices and, 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 and habits and everything. So it's going to take some time for it to completely go away. Good right, point. but at least you can still make strides in the right direction. Okay, and your you know, family physician can certainly help you along with that. Okay, sure. Let's move on. We do have another email. I want to okay. get to as many as we can here. Deb writes, I have rosacea for five years. I've had it. Now I've got hives on my back arm and a lot of my face. Where should I begin to get help? I That's, think looks sounds painful. Yeah, yeah. I mm -hmm. think it's it's firstly you know again, going to your, your primary doctor and saying, you know, what should I be doing? That way they can actually look at the rash and say, is it, is it hives? Is it a component of rosacea or something like that? Because sometimes treatments can be a little bit different. And, you know, do we need to, to refer out to a dermatologist to say, you need this type of treatment for that? Or, or can we handle it safely in the office? Have we become a society where we're going online first for our doctor and our medical help and advice? <laughs> can I ask that question of these two experts tonight? Um, I think our patients are well informed. You want to be careful with what sources you look up. Um, not everything is regulated on the internet, so you want to be very careful. Uh, if you have questions, you know, you can certainly ask your doctor. Uh, one thing I don't encourage patients to do is to definitively make their own diagnosis mm. right off the bat, mm -hmm. okay? If you have a question, if you have a concern, you know, talk to your doctor, mm -hmm. all right? If, if you read something, you know, it, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what the website was, okay? I mean, it could be reputable or, or otherwise, sure. all right? Have your doctor clarify for you. Okay. We were talking about the shingles vaccine and, and somebody has written in and wants a little more clarification, doctor. It's Anne writing, just wondering how effective the shingles vaccine is. How many people still get shingles in spite of the vaccine? So do we have some recent numbers or is the trend getting better yeah, with I, the vaccine? I, I think that, the, Anne, that's a great question. And the trend is getting better. And the, the unfortunate thing is that people with the vaccine still can get the shingles virus. We do see it and we, we do see immunity wean over time. And, and, and I think that's really where this, this new vaccine comes into play and it's a two dose vaccine. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, I don't have a lot of data of this new vaccine because it's not even out yet, you right. know, and, and right. we don't have a lot of, of trials to see on this, this brand new one. But I think there is gonna be more to come on that. Right, and uh, with the current vaccine that's out right now, there's probably, about, I guess, roughly a 50% reduction in the rate of shingles. And when you do get the shingles, it's not as severe as it normally would be if you didn't get the vaccine. Yeah. That's based on what I've looked at, so. Is there still um, a factor of stress that's involved with the whole shingles and onset and yeah. It can be. It, it, again, you know, you know, you know, Dr. Miller mentioned before about how the, the body gets under stress, doesn't do well with, with viruses mm -hmm. and can yep. be more susceptible. There is some things to suggest that stress is a huge trigger for, for shingles, outbreaks and, and, mm -hmm. and things. And that's why we encourage vaccinations if able and, and, and sometimes. And the other thing too is with stress, it affects everything. It affects yeah. this, it affects your immune system, mm -hmm. it affects your blood pressure. So there's a lot of things out there now that, you know, I encourage people to do and, and to try to reduce stress, whether it's meditating or getting out an exercise or something like that to reduce that burden on the body. Mm -hmm. We've got another caller. Let's get to Paul from Stoystown, please. Paul, you're on the air with our doctors. Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, as i have uh, beginning to age, I'm 63, uh, developed a uh, horrible sleep pattern. Uh, I try to have a regular schedule, 10 o'clock to go to bed, but I wake up at 2 and I'm wide awake and have trouble falling back to sleep. I get a little bit of exercise every morning and evening. Is, there, is that normal cycle as you age? Uh, is there something that uh, I can modify? Uh, been, it's been a very frustrating experience over the last two years trying to get a good amount of sleep. Oh, boy, that's going on. Any, any yeah. help on that subject? Well, well, 
I appreciate that question, Paul, and, and, and you know, I'm sorry to hear about your situation because sleep is really important to the body and, and we want to get you feeling better. Unfortunately, that's not an uncommon problem. We yeah. do see a lot of, of trouble sleeping and such. And, you know, I think, firstly, you hit the nail on the head by trying to, to set that same pattern every night, going to bed mm. at the same time every night. And things that I often encourage my patients is, you had said, you know, you exercise every evening, maybe not exercising very close to bedtime, you know, moving that up so you're not as ramped up right around bedtime. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is, is make sure that you try to follow a good sleep hygiene, meaning, when you're in bed, you're not watching TV, or you're not on a, on a phone or you know uh, writing or, or something like that. Just use that bed to, to go to sleep. And I think if these problems persist, I, I, I would you know talk to your family doctor to make sure that we need to rule out more serious illness such as sleep apnea. You know, mm. are you coming up because the body is starving for oxygen at night and, and things. So you know maybe making some of those those little changes to the regimen may help. And if that doesn't, please talk to your your, your family physician to talk about is there something that we can do and you know do you need to have a, a sleep medicine evaluation to rule out something like yeah. obstructive sleep apnea those have been effective I think the sleep studies and things and, mm -hmm. and studies absolutely uh, tweet here Tix, uh, Trixie is tweeting do you feel um, eating fresh fruit for a snack before bedtime is okay I've heard that one should not eat at all before bedtime but I did quit eating chips and now eat an apple or pomegranate aha uh -huh. we're talking about healthy habits yeah. and yeah. lifestyles yeah, good all right yeah no chips i love it no yeah. chips okay uh, time of day yeah. time of night yeah. oh. ingesting well it really doesn't make a big difference um, you know in my opinion i mean you're you know if it makes you feel good to have something before you go to bed if it helps you sleep at night you know that's absolutely fine if you wake up feeling refreshed fantastic with the yeah. apple or with, pomegranate, with, not with, the with, chips. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with the apple or pomegranate. Just be clear with this here. So, right. yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but if you're looking to lose weight, you know, maybe you don't want to eat something right before you go to bed. Okay, so it's just a, a different thing. But just for routine health, yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a that's a good question. And if you're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, is it eating a piece of fruit before bed okay? I think it's okay. The only thing you have to be careful with and you may develop is sometimes you might, if you eat close to bedtimes, might be a little bit more susceptible to, to something called reflux or heartburn, you know, because mm -hmm. if you eat that and you go right to bed and you're laying, exactly, right. you're laying flat, right. you might be more susceptible to acid. So if you say, you know, if I eat that food right before I go to bed, I get that reflux, might want to cut it out, but otherwise, I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we're talking about patterns here, so sure. we're, we're on a tangent here, and it looks like Sarah has written in an email that says, I've been struggling to get that full night of sleep lately. My mom suggested I try taking melatonin to help. Are there side effects to melatonin? Is it something that I should be taking nightly? Well, yeah. one, if you feel it helps, uh, there, there's very little, at least with my experience. It's over these, the counter, it's, it's a, a yes, supplement. It is over the counter, right. there are many brands that are out there. Um, you know. Nothing I've experienced would indicate that there's any contraindication or it's very harmful or anything. It's relatively safe. Uh, you know, I give it to my kids every once in a while if they need to sleep or if we need to sleep, I give it to my kids. Read into that, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think melatonin is fine. If you feel it's helpful, then you know, by all means, of course, you don't want to overdo it. You want to take the recommended dose. But if you feel it's helpful, yeah, I'm I, fine with that. I, so. I think it's it's great. It's it's been shown to be. A little bit helpful too, especially with travel. You know, if you're if you're going from time zone to time True. zone and and things of that, that you know, it may help reset that clock a little bit. You know, um, if you're taking it and it's working and you're not having any side effects or waking up groggy or headaches or anything of that, I think it's okay to continue. You know, that being, if if you have a question, is this safe for me? Ask your doctor. You know, we're here to help. We're we're here to to do that, and they can kind of look a little bit at your whole in-depth history and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. And speaking of history, let's take a look. We've got just about 10 minutes left, so we've got plenty of time, but I wanted to clarify the, the timeliness of visits now as you age, you know, what, what are you recommending now? What's, what's the time when you're, when you're healthy to, to do those well checkups uh, as a child and then as an adult? You're, that, the children well, haven't chi changed too much, have they? Right, well, um, children for the most part still once a year, but okay. of course, you know, when they're, when they're first born, we want to see them on a more regular basis, right. okay? We see them, you know, two weeks after they're born, then a month and two months, Four months, six, and you know, and so on and so forth. Okay, it's really just to see how well they're developing. Are they hitting all their milestones? Um, 
you know, they can get, you know, certain doses of vaccinations at certain times in their right. life, really, really in time frames. That's much okay, more so. regulated when you're young right. <laughs> to see the doctor. Right, absolutely, absolutely, okay. And then, you know, by the time they, you know, they hit four or five, they can still come in, you know, once a year for their regular checkups, mm -hmm. okay. But, of course, I tell patients, okay, if you need to come back in sooner for whatever reason, by all means, come back in and see us sooner, okay. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to limit everything to just one visit a year. And how so. about adults? Because it gets to be a little trickier, even with the cost of health care and, sure. you know, saying, well, I, I feel good. I'm not going to. Why, yeah. why do I need to come in? Right. And, and, and I think that, too, that's that's something that we see debated in internal medicine all the time. Do I need a physical? Do I know there, there's some schools of thought that say, yeah, you, you don't really need that anymore or I don't need to go. But I'm still a big believer in a yearly physical for mm -hmm. somebody that doesn't have any disease. Now, if, if there's underlying conditions, we might recommend coming back in three months or six months. But mm -hmm. if, if somebody's feeling well, we usually recommend a yearly physical. And, and to go back to those new guidelines, if you look at the new blood pressure guidelines, even the people that have blood pressures less than 120 over 80, it's still recommended that that's checked every year to catch something early. You know, there's also things that we can pick up at physical exams to talk about screenings, cholesterol, you know, do you need a, a colonoscopy for colon cancer screening, mammograms in women, you know, pap mm -hmm. smears, that type of things, because I think every physician out there would rather prevent a disease than treat a disease, you know, so if we can prevent it, right. that's where the physical comes in, getting your shots updated, mm -hmm. things of that. So I still recommend yearly physicals for everybody. Absolutely. Creating yeah. that database for exactly. yourself okay. right? to be okay. able to measure. And the big thing, like you were saying before, prevention, prevention, prevention is really the best way to, okay. you know, I think, to maintain perfect health. I mean, one so that's a good return yeah. on investment if you have sure. to spend it, well, spend it on a fit, well, well, well I mean, you know, to some of my gearheads that are out there, I mean, if you have that classic 1969 Chevrolet, I mean, you're still going to check Indeed. the oil, <laughs> rotate the tires. <laughs> that's a good Still exactly. running great, right? But still, you'll still want to do that, correct? Good point. So. All right, let's yeah. get to another email, <laughs> shall we? Teresa writes, whenever I'm outside in cold weather, it always feels my fingers get cold first, then stay cold the rest <laughs> of the day, even if the rest of my body warms up. Some have told me this sounds like Renyard, Renyard syndrome. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, is that serious, and how do I know if that's what I have? That's a great question, and, and that's a good question. Uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, it, it's something where cold weather kind of triggers a spastic response to the arteries in the hands, and the hands can turn different colors, red, white, and blue, and, and be very painful. And if you're worried about that condition, you know, talk to your doctor, get in. Uh, number one, if you are a smoker, cut that out immediately mm -hmm. because smoker smoking and the nicotine just increases that vasospasm it can make those symptoms worse some things that i recommend to my patients that that have Raynaud's and such is keeping those hands warm gloves at all times you know if you get out there and start having symptoms doing windmill type of exercises with that hand to get that blood flowing and if all else fails there are medications we can use to help prevent Raynaud's phenomenon okay all right uh, in children, mm. are there any newer preventive things that are on the horizon? Anything that, that you know? No, um, I can't really say there are. I mean, it's just, you know, still the old school of thought, still the, the best school of thought. Just, um, you know, proper hygiene, prevention, make sure they come into their follow-up appointments for their routine checkups, keep them vaccinated, you know, teach them proper nutrition, proper hygiene proper sleep patterns, which mm -hmm. is a lot easier said than done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there goes another right. tone again, right? right. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, just really, again, just prevention mm -hmm. is the key. I think you use really good common sense and, okay. you know, and, and again, if you have any doubts, any questions, just feel free to call up your provider. We've got another email coming in. Great. William, we're back on the shingles um, uh, controversy, or here it is. The gentleman has had shingles twice at age 30 and last year at age 68. Should I still get the vaccine? Yes. Yes. Uh, if 68, I believe, was yes. the, the age? Yes, 68. Yes, that's, that's indicated to get that shingles vaccine. Even if you've had shingles in the past, um, you would want to get the shingles vaccine because I think even Dr. Miller recommended and had said before correctly that when you get the vaccine, the outbreaks in the future tend to be less, tend to be less severe, you know. So um, now the timing of that, you don't want to do it right away, right when you just got treated for shingles the second time. So, you know, talk to your physician about the right time for being treated, but I would still recommend the vaccine as somebody that is 68, especially too, because immunity will wean as we get older and shingles uh, outbreaks can be more serious the older we get. Okay. 
timely question here on heart uh, and, and hypertension here. My wife visited her physician recently, early morning appointment. Her BP was 117 over 70. Later in that same day, she visited her dentist, and the hygienist there took her BP, which was 180 over 85 in both arms. What could be an explanation for such a drastic increase within just a few hours? Now, of course, she's concerned and monitoring it several times a day. Sure. That's another great question. I think, too, it's not just checking the blood pressure. It's how are we checking the blood pressure? And there's, there's recommendations. You know, you always want to make sure that if you're in a doctor's or a dentist's office that we're not using a wrist cuff if we're able not to, you know, that we're using a manual cuff at the arm. The other thing, too, you want to make sure that when you have your blood pressure taken, you've been sitting with the feet on the floor, you know, resting for five to ten minutes. And then that, that blood pressure ideally is taken right on the skin and is put, you know, right at that arm, resting at heart level to see what it is. That being said, if, if there are, you know, everything was equal that way, sometimes anxiety can really increase the, 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 the blood pressure. I mean, I love my dentist. I, I think he does a great job, but I still get very anxious when I, when I go to the dentist, you know, and, and things of like that. But I think if the blood pressure was that high at that time, you know, checking at home maybe two times in the morning, you know, a minute apart with you just sitting on the feet flat on the floor, resting five minutes, and then maybe again at supper time to see what the trend is, that's a good idea. All right, just a minute left, so I want to ask for a real quick prescription for better health from each of you. What would be your, your top points to impart tonight to our viewers and listeners? I, I think, you know, uh, firstly, I just want to say thank you for, for having me on. It was, it's been a pleasure and been nice chatting with all you guys. And, Absolutely. you know, my, my big things would be prevention, prevention, prevention. Get your shots. You know, make sure that you're eating a healthy lifestyle with plenty of fresh fruits, plenty of fresh vegetables. You know, the other thing too is is make sure you get that exercise in, those stress reduced techniques. And please remember, your primary doctor is always there for you. Contact them with questions. Absolutely. Um, again, thank you for having us. I mean, sure. this was a lot of fun. It was yeah. a great big pleasure to be here. Um, again, prevention is the key, I think, to really good health. Um, aside from you know everything that uh, Dr. Dobastin was saying. You know, listen to your body. Your body knows best, okay? The body knows what it has to do. You just have to let it do its thing, okay. all right? And if you have any questions, concerns, you know, by all means, please talk to your doctor. He'll be there to help straighten everything out for you. Thank you so much. You guys are, you. are great members of the community and uh, wish I was your patient, I think. You know, at this right. point, that's okay. great. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank again our guests, Dr. Philip Miller, family medicine provider with Mount Nittany Physician Group, and Dr. Timothy Doberstein, an internist with Geisinger Cedary Park office in State College. I'm Carolyn Donaldson, and for all of us here at WPSU, we wish you better health, and we thank you so much for joining us tonight.